thank you again for joining us for the Situate Historical Society GAR Hall Special Event Zoom Edition. So I was looking back this week and um, we have done 21 of these presentations since last August. So I wanna thank the Historical Society for letting me bring these events to you and for them for sponsoring them all. As you know, we don't charge anything for these. We do accept donations, those are greatly appreciated. And I've put some information in the chat section in case you wanted to take a look at that. Um, we've had people, presenters from all over the country, people joining in to the events from all over the country. John himself is in Maine tonight. We wouldn't be able to do this in person and have a speaker such as John without Zoom. I know a lot of people are like, just had it with Zoom. They've had it with masks, they've had it with Zoom. I think for our purposes here for the society, it's been great. We've got a great following. I see so many familiar people. I was just speaking with someone before we started. She said, I'm so sorry I missed last week. I've seen every one of them. So that's great. And we thank you all for following us. And we hope, you know, when things open up again, maybe things will be a little different, but we're just working through figuring out how we can still bring you these quality presenters and um, be able to share them with everyone. So just to let you know, in two weeks, we've got Borderland, the um, documentary on Blanche Ames Ames. And a lot of you have probably already got the email on that. So we hope you'll join us for that. Got a couple things for um, July. And beyond that, we're still, like I said, we're still trying to figure out how we're going to handle things. But, so I'm not gonna waste any more time. Um, I wanna thank the Situate Garden Club for hosting John with us tonight. Those of you who don't know, the Situate Garden Club maintains the Situate Wildflower Garden, which is at the Man House, which is on Greenfield Lane in Situate. They just had a huge, very successful plant sale a few weeks ago, which I'm sure a lot of you went to. Anyways, you can check them out on Facebook as well, as you can check us out. But I'm not gonna give any introduction because I'm sure so many of you know who John is. He is John Forte, the heirloom gardener. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I think I've known a lot of you since I grew up in the area, um, but I also started my professional career off as um, the horticulturist and horticulture director at Plymouth Plantation and worked there for about 12 years. Then I was recruited to go up into New Hampshire to be the curator of historic landscapes at Strawberry Bank Museum. And it was there that I started doing work with an organization called Slow Food International and started a chapter there and started working on their International Biodiversity Committee. Um, then I was lured off to the Massachusetts Horticultural Society where I was working until I just um, about three years ago came to be the founding director of what's just now becoming a new public garden for New Hampshire, a place, really wonderful place called Bedrock Gardens. And as soon, like about a week and a half after I took this new job at Bedrock Gardens, the um, executive, well, the chief editor at Timber Press contacted me and he asked if I would write a book on garden history my first response was to say, your timing is terrible. I just started a new job. Can I wait a couple of years and get back to you? And he was very kind about that. But more so, I also asked that instead of writing a book about history, that I could write a book that would let enable history to help guide us to find ways as gardeners to bridge divides. I think we've been living in really interesting times, you know, um, the evolution of farmers markets and um, local agriculture's resurgence. Um, at the same time where a lot of people, instead of seeing green or seeing extremes of red or blue, and I just think gardeners know how to find common ground. So I really took this book as an opportunity to write about common ground, and really celebrate this new emerging arts and crafts movement that I see happening. That's a land-based arts and crafts movement that's coming to life through farmers markets and Etsy sites and 
marketplaces that didn't exist before, but also something that lets gardeners grow into a meaningful way to help preserve environment. So the name of my new book is The Heirloom Gardener, Traditional Plants and Skills for the Modern World. And I just received the first copies of it um, shipped to me for some book signings. And I have to say, I love the way they, I'd ask that they'd make it like an old almanac size, because I've noticed as I get older and I love reading in bed, it's a great size to hold up over my head while I'm reading. And um, they really chose wonderful fonts. And I got to work with a wonderful woodcut artist, Mary Azarian, who's done some phenomenal work um, that illustrates the book. And so I really feel privileged to have been able to take a book out into the world during a time of pandemic. That, that's what I did during the pandemic was open a garden, write a book, gain a bunch of weight. And uh, now I'm back out in the world enjoying a new garden and losing the weight and getting a book into the world. And I feel like we've all come through a lot. And I hope this book is a wonderful thing to emerge with like a garden in spring. Um, so I've always loved this woodcut by Mary Azarian as well as the quote that says, when the world wearies and ceases to satisfy, there's always a garden. And I think as gardeners, it's been one of those things that we've been able to, and I just need to make this shrink away so that I can, there we go. Um, I think as gardeners, we know that everything is, there's always a new opportunity with every spring. We're able to see a new chance. We start new seeds. We help plants emerge. And every time we get others involved in that process, and especially kids, it's just a great reminder that the creation of a thousand forests is in one acorn, as Ralph Waldo Emerson said. We, we have a chance to participate in meaningful change one backyard at a time. So for me, gardening is very much about a sense of place. I start here with you because I was raised in historically what was South Situate. I grew up at the Fox Hill shipyard on the North River. And this is what it looked like in a postcard about 100 years before me um, and my birth or a little after. And you know, for a lot of New England, you could see sometimes for miles without seeing a tree on the landscape. After agriculture had you know, been clearing the land for generations for farming and for timber, you know, ships like the um, Columbia that went out to the Columbia River we, were built right here at the Fox Hill shipyard. And for me growing up, this is me swimming in that river as a kid, I was acutely aware of the history in the stone walls that ran through woods instead of fields and pastures. We had an old well on our property that dated back to the 17th century shipwright's house and tavern that was still across the street. Um, and the foxes that gave it the name Fox Hill still romped down the hill behind our house, raising their kit foxes every spring in a legacy that I knew went back to at least the 17th century when it was given that name. Um, the river was the Stutucket River in the uh, native language. Um, and that speaks of the place in a different way and reminding us that really we were all products of that place. And I, I loved that when I went there to visit recently, I was able to juxtapose this, the map, uh, the Google map with this and um, you know, this was how I lived across from the river with a, an old field. And there was a Roxbury russet apple tree in front of that shipwright's house and tavern. And I knew it was an apple, but I knew I'd never seen another apple like that. And the entire neighborhood could be up in that one tree playing and eating these apples that looked like tree bark but no bugs bothered them because it had a really hard skin. And so nobody ever sprayed it, but they were beautiful apples. And what I realized as I was growing up is that when people don't realize what they have, it's a lot harder for them to think about preserving it. And later owners of that house came along and they painted over the walls of the, of the living room that 
depicted the entire course of the river and all of its shipyards that went back centuries. And they cut down the Roxbury russet apple tree that had been there for centuries and centuries. So for me, I love to think about how we participate in stewardship and preservation as gardeners. As a kid, my parents' house was one of the first homes that went in along that stretch of a few miles along the river. And I grew up with these amazing wild cherry trees and it was deep pine forest laden with lady slippers, which are blooming now or moccasin flower in the native tongue. And they would be blooming by the hundreds along that stretch of river. And as I watched other houses go in, even by the time I was 10 or 12, I was getting in front of bulldozers, <laughs> digging up lady slipper patches that they were going to plow under and transplanting them in patches that now have colonized further. And so I think all of these things came to be influences for me. I thought about the water in that well and what we drank. There's a quote from uh, a Native American writer, Linda Hogan, that I've always loved that says, walking, I am listening to a deeper way. Suddenly all of my ancestors are behind me. Be still, they say, watch and listen. You are the result of the love of thousands. And in that neighborhood, I was always aware from the arrowheads we'd find to the plants, to the turtles that would hatch out generation after generation in the same place under the same tree, or the families of rabbits that I would help save each year, that this was a connection to the past. And I really love those gardening influences that came to me early from being raised in such a special area, um, that area that we all live in. Sometimes other languages are better at expressing things or they're a help in expressing things that I might struggle with. Um, there's a Irish word, tenelach, that, say, that speaks of the relationship one has with the land, the air, the water, a deep connection that makes you one with nature. For me, these are little, down here in the corner by the arrowhead, you see little um, snapping turtles hatching out of eggs. That connection, watching snapping turtles hatch year after year between the choke cherry and the lilac in the big field by the river. My child's imagination told me that they've been hatching there in that place since the time of the dinosaurs. And in some ways, they probably have been. But I, I watch these things today with the same kind of amazement. And I think gardeners have a great way of still looking at the world with wonder. And in these days, it can be pretty easy to get jaded about things. But I think our gardens and our landscapes really remind us of things that refresh us. In, in Japan, they speak of shinrin-yoku. Um, it's the way uh, that well, you might have heard it called forest bathing. What happens when you breathe in the air of place and how much that influences us, like the foods we eat in place and the water we drink. Um, so for me, it was the old sugar maples that made up um, the sugar bush in that neighborhood. It was the staghorn sumac that the birds were relying on every spring and that people had been using for spice and medicine for centuries. The cattails that every spring the red-winged blackbirds would land on and sing their songs before it was even warm enough to imagine a bird would want to migrate. So for me, that was sort of a baseline for the book is how, these, how place connects us as gardeners, no matter where we garden past, present, or future, uh, finding those elements of place and building on them and, and our own unique heritage and carrying that forward. So I wanted to ask all of you, who taught you to love plants and the natural world? Rachel Carson said, if a child is to keep his inborn sense of wonder, he needs the companionship of at least one adult who can share it, rediscovering with him the joy, excitement and mystery of the world we live in. This is my mind on plants when I was a kid. This is one of my neighbors here in Maine um, popping up through the side of an old apple tree in the neighborhood. Uh, this is a child in complete joy in a children's garden that I designed uh, for Elm Bank at Massachusetts Horticultural Society when I was there, um, redesigned and rehabilitated. These are things that help kids connect and right now, 
studies are showing that on average, kids know fewer than 10 animals and plants in their backyards, but they know hundreds and hundreds of corporate logos. And so partly the work in my career and the work I uh, put into this book is about trying to help foster connections where families can get out from behind blue screens because it's not just the kids, we're all sitting here tonight too, and devices and rediscover the science and the joy and the magic and the, the pace of nature. Slowing down to that pace can be an important tool for moving through times like these. And one of the ways that this was carried out in the past was botanizing. Um, through the centuries, whole families would go out botanizing. They would be looking for uh, butterflies and caterpillars and insects that they could identify. But also they made herbaria. Um, herbaria is the plural of an herbarium. And an herbarium was kind of like a sampler, like a young woman would make a sampler and learn her stitches, learn her alphabet, her numbers, art and craft. An herbaria helped you to press botanical specimens from your backyard. This page is one from Emily Dickinson's herbarium with pressed Queen Anne's lace and um, heel all or prunella. Um, this is a, an, an algal herbarium that was made by a New England boy that was down in Florida and uh, as a cabin boy on a ship and he sent it back to his sister in New England for a Christmas present. Um, but pressing specimens and then you'd write the common name, the Latin name if you knew it, where you found it, the date or the season. And they tell us a great deal about the past today. They, they help us learn about things like how climate has changed and how bloom time has uh, been reflecting uh, that change. But it's really above all else, almost like a, a recipe book that you can go back to for the rest of your life. And even as an adult, I teach a lot of my volunteers to make herbaria as a way to learn the plants of their garden and learn it as a group together and have fun making it into an art project, a book where you just fold page after page of these pressed specimens. I also love getting kids to think, and not just kids, families to think about fostering habitat where they live because it makes it fun again, whether it's you know, the native Lobelia syphilotica and all of a sudden seeing the uh, hummingbirds that come back around or native sassafras or the pollinators and the bugs you see when you leave, when you encourage and foster habitat. This is the spicebush swallowtail caterpillar, which is one of the best faces I've ever seen on wildlife, mimicking a big eyes and face so he looks fierce, or planting and or fostering the habitat for Asclepius or milkweeds and butterfly weeds for the monarchs, or even encouraging things like jewelweed as a poison ivy deterrent leaving praying mantises to get out there and um, help eat less beneficial bugs, but also getting our families out into nature to enjoy them, whether it's seeing fireflies, hearing mockingbirds um, or crickets or frogs and tadpoles, or getting out foraging like these old images of families foraging. So for me as a garden historian, I really like to start with the layers <clears throat> of native horticulture. And that for me in many ways ties to the three sisters and their kin, the, the native plants they would encourage around their fields. And for a lot of kids and families, it's a great way to garden and school gardens, especially with some of the plants that fed us for thousands of years. When I first got to Massachusetts Horticultural Society, I was doing some research and I found their oldest emblem or what we would call a logo today. And it depicts a Massachusetts Indian or native. Um, and it says just below the first act of civilization. And it shows a Massachusetts man farming. Oh, I'm sorry, it would have been a woman. So Massachusetts woman farming. And what was being done was uh, corn, was planted first when the shad bush was blooming, and then beans and squash, so that the three grew together in a symbiotic relationship, but they also together provided a completely nutritionally balanced diet. We know today that pound for pound, it yields the highest of any other method of planting known in the world today. 
And they are also self-fertilizing because the beans are fixing nitrogen in the soil for the next year. The vines of the gourds and squash and pumpkins are keeping down weeds. And then all of those things can be either eaten fresh or stored over winter. They were grown with companion plants like Jerusalem artichoke, a root tuber that early New Englanders called potatoes of Canada, um, or ground nuts, Apios americana, that were also eaten like potatoes and help sustain people through the, some of the most difficult parts of winter. But also when we're fostering habitat as gardeners, it's one of the best links to how we can make an impact on the environment we share and our cultural inheritance that we really share as a commonwealth. Um, this, that can mean that every woodland is a community and that we're part of a woodland or a watershed. Wow. So when I was planting and harvesting winter be uh, berry or Ilex verticillata, I'd put bunches of them into an urn by my front door here the first year I'd moved to Maine. And all of a sudden in the middle of winter, a flock of bluebirds flew in and they picked them clean. And it really reminded me of that huge connection between native plants and habitat because you know full well, they eat them, they pass through their systems with little fertilizer packets, and they spread a native plant that we put into our environment. So I try to plant them, I put them in wreaths, and that's the same with the native uh, viburnums, plants like blackberries, oaks, uh, milkweed, they're all a part of that. And when we get a healthier environment, we see our native pollinators as well as honeybees return. We see bird populations. How many of you have seen a walking stick recently? They used to be all around when I was growing up in Norwell, but they look like a stick. They're, in the, they're relative of the praying mantis. But plant, um, animal, you know, creatures like the walking stick and salamanders, they're really indicators of a healthy environment. And when we stop seeing the whippoorwills and the bob white quail and the salamanders and walking sticks, it means that we're not living in a diverse habitat. But as gardeners, again, we can influence that by what we plant. One of the ways that I think has been helping new generations get back to an acquaintance with nature where there's a comfort level and a kinship with nature that makes them want to be stewards of it is foraging. And, you know, I think a lot of people think maybe foraging is something that only hipsters in Brooklyn do, but I'd like to ask all of you, how many of you grew up foraging? Usually people aren't so quick to say they did that, but if you think about how many of you went out picking blueberries as a family or blackberries, or picking up those wild apples that were um, descendants of early introductions, maybe harvesting fiddleheads or um, sumac to make um, spice or rose hips for tea. This is an image of a whole community out picking um, American chestnuts before the blight. These are all ways that many of us were accustomed to foraging, not just mushrooms and ramps and really rare things, but the everyday things that supplemented our diet and gave us really nutritious foods in the shoulder seasons. Um, this is a friend of mine, Kathy Gunst uh, from NPR's Here and Now. We were working on a story on ramps or the wild leeks. And for every time I speak about foraging, I also like to think about what we can do as with ramps to plant native populations and foster new habitat for them. So really, I have since grown whole colonies of them from seed and transplant from where they're rich, so that now I have a dozen patches in my own backyard. And when I think of foraging now, I also see one friend in this group tonight who told me that she put herself through college growing up in, on the South Shore, harvesting seaweed. And that's within, you know, one of our peers. Um, these are ways that we seem to have grown disconnected very quickly, but younger generations are putting those connections back in place in meaningful ways. And that's a big part of what my book tries to celebrate. We're just coming past a season of fiddleheads now. 
And so, like many of the essays in my book, I try to pair up information on regional plants and uh, skill sets that are wonderful to carry over into the modern age. Not just because you can go out and forage for this, but because it's a very easy plant to grow in your own garden. And it's beautiful when you do, and it's inspiring. I, um, in the book, I, I think I talk about them as being something like the moxie of greens in New England. They are, if you've never had them, a pungent spring flavor that's like eating a green bog, but it's everything that's been stored over winter. And that's sort of eating a spring tonic in many ways. So the book really delves into many of those old ways that help sustain us, that we can see among the First Nations in our region that were the inhabitants before us, and then the, the layers that every generation of immigrants added to that in New England since people arrived here. And they can be things like making hotbeds and cold frames, maybe a spalier or how to overwinter plants, how to line out gardens or uh, make raised beds, or how to bring those things to table based in a long history of celebrating those regional foods and um, the things that come of our gardens. Local traditions that really help remind us that we're not going through anything for the first time in history. You know, by World War II, um, most Americans were already forgetting how to garden. And the U.S. government reached out, partnered with Cooperative Extension Services and universities and garden clubs to really reshape how, well, we taught gardening again, taught people how to can. Um, they were very concerned about getting kids out of mills. Um, and into gardens as well. So school gardens became uh, a thing that the Massachusetts Horticultural Society helped to bring back around. Um, and these generations of new immigrants also were reviving ways uh, from old countries that were helping to take over some of the forgotten farms in New England and bring some of the soil back to life. And I think for a lot of us, our grandparents or our parents, or some of us maybe have memories of Victory Gardens that really taught us that nobody should be sitting behind a, sh a bushel of beans alone, uh, but some things are better done in community and with family, and there's great joy in that. And so my book really tries to celebrate the process that, you know, bird's eye doesn't do it better, and frozen peas aren't better, and canned spinach isn't better, and I can really believe it's not butter. You know, generations now know the flavor of true ripe tomatoes, heirloom sun-ripened tomatoes. And these are legacies that have come to us because we've almost forgotten many times in the past. And like now, we've had to remind ourselves. And so my book tries to do that as well. Remind us how to save seeds, how to process food, to eat fresh or to preserve. There's a quote from Thomas Moore that I've always loved that says, the ordinary arts we practice every day at home are of more importance to the soul than their simplicity might suggest. As gardeners, you know you don't have to do this every day. You don't have to cook a scratch meal every day, but what we tend to do most days becomes a habit. And if we are adding a little something from our garden every day, or if we're getting something from a farmer's market and keeping a farm afloat, if we are eating something sun ripened, they become our new habits. And that's a big part of the shift that I also like to celebrate in this book. At the base of that for me it are heirloom plants. Um, when I first starting, started working with heirloom plants at Plymouth Plantation, I was fresh out of college and the internet was really non-existent um, or helpful. And if you were going to find heirloom plants, you were going out to old farms and native communities and really working hard to find what had been grown before you. Now, for any of you that are interested in growing heirloom plants, there's so much more broad access and through seed lending libraries and seed saving uh, enterprises and banks, 
this is a, a seed chest um, from the New Hampshire Farm Museum down on the bottom left. And in that one chest that event, this uh, itinerant seed salesman was carrying, there were 17 different New England seed houses. And that was less than a hundred years ago. After World War II, most of the chemical companies bought up the seed companies and suddenly all you could buy were heirloom seeds. Now heirloom seeds have some purposes in the world, but they are certainly, their, their greatest purpose is that they're patentable and that seed companies can own them. Yet heirloom seeds are a part of our cultural inheritance. They've been handed down to us generation after generation as a place-based plant. Whereas agribusiness put all of its emphasis onto seeds that would work out in the Midwest where agriculture or agribusiness is seeded. Now, if you have open pollinated, genetically diverse heirlooms, they don't all ripen at the same time. If there are hybrids, they will. If one is blighted, you'll always have survivors. But if they're hybrids, the entire lot is blighted. But if you want to have a mechanized harvester go through your field, you want them all ripened on the same day. You don't, you know, you don't want your spinach or your tomatoes to come in for weeks and weeks and weeks. But also that connection for me from seed to table back to seed to table year after year is something that I've valued since I was a kid. I remember going to my grandparents' house in the middle of a city where they kept a courtyard garden. And if he ate a good tomato that he'd like, the one that didn't split the first to ripen, he'd say, oh, that's the best tomato I've ever had. Everything was the best he'd ever had, um, unless it was rotten or terrible. But then he'd just smear those tomato seeds on the side of a brown paper shopping bag, fold it up, write down what kind of tomato it was on the side of the bag and put it up on top of his ice box. And that connection from year to year is what goes on with heirloom seeds. There are plants like the Boothby Blonde Cucumber that you see in the bottom uh, center, whoops, um, that was preserved by a Maine farm family, or the um, white eggplant that helped you remember my eggplant got its name. Um, I grew some in a children's garden that I created at Strawberry Bank in Portsmouth and shared the seeds with a local farmer who ended up bringing them in egg cartons to farmer's market and making a pretty penny because he was so clever as marketing them that way. But for me, one of the most important parts of heirloom preservation is that it enables all of us to be participants in an act of stewardship and preservation that's critical. In the last hundred years or more now, we've lost over 90% of the genetic diversity among the crops that fed the world. It might seem like we have all of these things in the supermarket that maybe you didn't have growing up, but that's because you were, after World War II, seeing the slimmest production we'd ever seen, but also every county had an apple it was famous for. Every town had a green that overwintered really well for them and did well in Situate and Norwell and Hanover and uh, Boston and Cape Cod and that's the kind of diversity that makes it so that every time you save a seed from your best produce in your backyard, you're adapting it to the light, the soil, the length of season, but also the flavors you like. Maybe the, the Wampanoag tradition was harvesting multicolored flint corn. Um, and you know, they, in the 17th century, there were eight rows. By the 20th century, they had sometimes 20 rows because again, people want to improve yield and production. But those heirloom seeds, when we actively save and cultivate them, um, as this artist, uh, I forget her first name right now, Kibben, uh, depicted here, are the true currency of life. Um, so for me, as a garden historian working in museums and public gardens, what I've really enjoyed doing is taking things like um, we found seed packets in the walls of houses in the south end of Portsmouth. Um, this one had uh, white carrot seeds in it with brass pins closing it up. And you can see it's created just like these seed packets that um, Linnaeus 
made. So I often teach people how to make seed packets this way, but there was another one here that we had in the collection that was tied up with milkweed twine, brown paper, and it had cranberry beans. A bean that I can see was grown in that same neighborhood for over 1500 years uh, by the Wabanaki uh, right through the Victory Garden era. But then suddenly between World War II and the present, they'd completely fallen out of use because the seed companies wanted to sell us the beans that they were growing in the Midwest. So what I've tried to do is pair my work through organizations like, well, the museums, gardens, and slow food to make it so that we revive those heirloom seeds and make it the coveted plant that every chef wants to serve, every farmer brings to farmer's market. And suddenly these are the the plants of place that our communities want to embrace again. So they become community preservation acts. And that's something all of us can be doing in our own communities that, that help us really make uh, these small integrated farms have a value and a niche market that isn't going to compete with industrial meat or um, potatoes that are all the same in America because it's the potato that McDonald's wants. It's really nice to rediscover the varieties that provide variety, let's just say. Daniel Webster, who you know from Marshfield, uh, would also say, let us not forget the cultivation of the earth is the most important labor of man. Whether tillage begins, I'm sorry, when tillage begins, other arts will follow. The farmers, therefore, are the founders of civilization. Reiterating what Mass Hort said about the Massachusetts natives. When we get our local farms reactivated, we're keeping them alive into a future when, you know, right now we see our produce on average being shipped over 2,000 miles before it gets to our house. These farms, when we are raising animals and a little bit of this crop and a little bit of that crop, they're, they're more resilient than miles and miles of a soybean or a corn crop. And you end up using that manure to fertilize the fields. And when we revive local agriculture, suddenly we're all caring more about the soil quality, the air quality, and the water quality where we live. Michael Pollan likes to say that, these, that the farmer, farmer's markets are the new community gathering spaces in America. And I loved it when he quoted me, quoting my little old Italian grandmother, saying it's better to pay the grocer than the doctor. You know, a lot of people think that this is sometimes an elitist movement or that farmers markets are expensive, but they're the first ones to get out, buy out, buy into the new technology or the huge screen TV. But when we invest into our local farms, what we're also doing is making sure that when it no longer makes sense and petroleum prices get inevitably higher, or water demands are greater out in Arizona and California. We want to know how to grow and to still have the land to grow produce to feed ourselves right where we live. And so to me, my book is also a celebration of the fact that within the last 20 years, we have grown farmers markets from fewer than 2,000 in America to over 20,000 in less than 15 years. Slow food is just one of those vehicles that helps us remember that food is culture, identity, and wealth. And really slow food was created by its founder in Italy. It's now in 120 countries around the world, but um, it's really looking at fast food uh, culture and trying to slow it down to the pace of maybe getting together around a table. Do you remember when we used to do that before microwaves? Um, to me, that process also doesn't allow a country to become so polarized because when you have to sit and have conversations together, you remember humanity, you remember each other, like you work at, like working in a garden together. When you have more than you need, as the saying goes, build a longer table, not a higher fence. You share those things, like gardeners share plants and wisdom. You get to seed your garden and eat your garden and share those things. Um, these are some of the 
vice presidents of Slow Food, Vandana Shiva, a brilliant scientist from India, Alice Waters uh, from Shea Panese, who start, restarted the school gardens movement in Berkeley, um, and Carlo, Carlo Petrini uh, when we were over in Italy together. So, you know, you've heard the expression through the years, you are what you eat. But one of the things we're also learning is that local agriculture provides a new marketplace for all kinds of things, um, foods that are more healthfully grown, um, but also science is helping us realize that simple things like the food that is raised to full ripeness in place that has not been put into storage can have as much as 70% greater nutritional value. That's like my grandmother, investing into health. And even people like her that came to this country without means still understood that this is your top investment. This is your health, your brain power. And so for me, I've been a lifelong organic gardener and organic is another part that uh, local food helps bring into the possibilities. So some of my chapters get into that and also talk about it as a skill set because I don't know anybody that really wants to harm the earth. We just need more skills to share so that we all have new inroads to solve our problems organically, to nourish our plants organically, and to rethink how we raise the food that we eat. Elder Leopold said, we abuse land because we regard it as a commodity belonging to us. But when we see the land as a community or a habitat, as I was saying, to which we belong, we may begin to use it with love and respect. I don't know about you, but when I grow asparagus and I see that breaking through the ground in spring, I have a reverence for the land and what comes of that. And, you know, part of what I was talking about in the slow food culture is what, a, you know, the throwaway culture that we've become. And I think gardeners intuitively know the difference. Um, I put in this quote that I'm just going to read quickly. It's pretty amazing that our society has reached a point where the effort necessary to extract oil from the ground, ship it to a refinery, turn it into plastic, shape it appropriately, truck it to a store, buy it and bring it home is considered to be less effort than what it takes to just wash the spoon when you're done with it. This book really for me is a way of reminding gardeners how we can slow down to the pace of our gardens, rethink and reshape the way we live with our environment. And it's part of that great learning, again, working with kids because we all have great gardening knowledge, great historical knowledge in our heads, but the kids have some great sustainable knowledge in their heads. And when we get together around a table, there's a lot that we can successfully rethink. And I love that historical societies, garden clubs, herb societies are doing that. So I'd love for all of you to give a quick thought to how the pandemic shifted you. Did you start making more scratch meals again, using things from your seasonal garden, maybe growing uh, in cold frames, hoop houses, hot beds, baking bread, brewing beer. These are a lot of the ways that I think maybe the pandemic reminded us that we've been going at a breakneck pace for quite a while and that the gardens help remind us to slow it back and to respect the place we live in. So one of the ways that I think a lot of Americans reconnected was in their kitchen gardens. Right now, there are more Americans gardening there than there were during World War II in the Victory Garden era. And that's an amazing statistic. And for a lot of people, this is their first foray into it. Others have been doing it for generations. But it's taking our backyards and reconsidering, using some of this historic precedent, how we can grow things to nourish our family as they've been doing in kitchen gardens for centuries, right outside their kitchen door. Because when you're doing it in your kitchen, uh, near your kitchen, you use it more. So my book really explores in different essays, gardening as a craft. You know, we've seen a lot of mow and blow crews go through our yards. And um, for many generations, the art of fine gardening was lost. And right now it's coming back around. And anybody that will work as a fine gardener can get paid admirably for doing that work and especially helping people um, 
use their yards for multiple purposes, beauty and food. And I remember when my grandfather would come to my parents' house on the North River and along the stone wall that helped to support the hill behind us, my mother had peonies, or as my grandfather called, called them, peonies. But if he could, when she wasn't looking, he'd, just, he'd slip tomatoes in between the peonies, an eggplant in between the pasta. Uh, the pasta. <laughs> and I, at the time, just thought he was a crazy old man. But now I've become that same advocate for the landscape and for the pleasure of using your landscape for beauty as well as nourishment. Louis Neiser said, a man who works with his hands is a laborer. A man who works with his hands and his head is a craftsman, but a man who with his hands and his head and his heart, who works with his hand, his head and his heart is an artist. And today more artists are coming together, learning how to can and put up food and build out these gardens that are taking us into the future, but also reviving a lot of the homestead garden skills, putting up arbors, raising bees, keeping cold frames, Put, hanging your laundry on a line and maximizing your garden space from every urban yard. It's relearning how to do things like coppice and pollard trees so that, or even just pruning your orchards or anything in your yard gives you all of this wood. And like the spoons, instead of buying a throwaway plastic fence that ends up in a landfill in two or three years, Wattle fences last me at least as long as that, but they're far more beautiful. And most of the time they're made from the free fall in my own yard. And there is a great sense of satisfaction, but also participation and sustainability in doing that. So small yard fruits into our gardens again. Because, you know, you see so many yards where they build a house, they cut down every last thing, strip away this topsoil, and there's no life there for human or habitat. And by planting in things like quince and currants and gooseberry and elderberry and cherry, cranberry, raspberry, blueberry and pawpaw, we can be growing these American and uh, introduced fruits that really have been part of our heritage for centuries. It's also remembering that plants have long been our medicine. And in most of the world, Medicine didn't have a breakup um, between pharmacy as we did in this country. And now that we're finally learning to analyze the chemical constituents of plants and learn about them and partner it with the histor historical herbalism, we're able to bring more of this back and understand so much more about why people use plants as they did. If, I, if you think back to what you might have grown up with herbal med as herbal medicine, it's like foraging. Most of us grew up with things like chamomile tea or ginger ale um, or for an upset stomach or ginger tea, mint tea for an upset tummy, or maybe you had beets or spinach for iron or your blood. Maybe you had bitters with your drinks so that um, it would strengthen your liver or had uh, candied fennel seeds or bulb fennel for digestion. Maybe you had oranges or tomato for vitamin C or garlic or echinacea for your immune system. Maybe you enjoyed a hot toddy or had apples to keep the doctor away or prunes to stay regular or carrots for your eyesight. These are all ways that now science is helping us understand that there's simple medicine in our garden and there was lots of traditional learning to back it up. If you've ever had wasabi with your sushi, that's because wasabi is a vermifuge. And the way to avoid intestinal worms that can come from raw seafood is by using wasabi. If you're using sage, it's antibacterial and antimicrobial. So bacteria that would form in the cavity of a turkey, well, that's allayed by stuffing the turkey with sage dressing. Um, using, again, garlic as um, a, um, an antibiotic. It is a natural antibiotic. Um, plants like ladies' bed straw is a natural rennet. If a plant had m the name motherwort, like motherwort or ladies' mantle, um, that's, a, that's for women's health. If it has a name like mugwort, it's for brewing. Um, and plants like St. John's wort that were said to be good for the sanguine humor or your emotional well-being, 
made an oil that was the color of blood to remind you it was good for the sanguine humor. People learn those things like they learn how to make an herbarium. So they were more comfortable with that knowledge of blending food as medicine into your life. Not in a big way that's crazy thinking or strange thinking, but the same way that you knew that spinach was uh, good for you or that, you know, when the pharmaceutical industry started to bring herb plants into pharmacy again, when we understood that kale was good for colon cancer, they instantly tried to turn it into a pill and the pills didn't do anything. And what we realized is sometimes you just need to eat your damn roughage and eat whole plants that are far more chemically diverse than the medicines we try to make from them. Wendell Berry says, herbalism is based on our rela on relationship between plant and human, plant and planet, human and planet. Using herbs in the healing process means taking part in an ecological cycle. And that's what I've really loved about herbs is that continuation, making pesto. You don't make that in the middle of summer. You make a fresh basil sauce, but pesto is how you preserve it. Same way so much comes to life in a teapot for herbal medicine. And the pleasure of making things like candied angelica as a digestive. They're all fun ways to work from the herb garden. This is an ethnobotanical herb garden I created at Strawberry Bank at Portsmouth, New Hampshire with the help of the Herb Society and some friends there. And ways of looking at what every generation that's lived in America from the native population to the most recent immigrants have brought to our pharmacy and to our diet. Another great poster child for the local foods movement is the local brew movement. And I think craft beer has been another great part of what's come about in all of this. And I've had great fun as a garden historian brewing with folks like the head of Dogfish Head Brewery and Portsmouth Brewery and giving our then president and now president beers made from hops in one of the historic gardens that had been growing hops on their arbor for over a hundred years. It's reviving plants like ale hoof and mugwort and ale cost that were traditional brewing herbs long before we used hops. Tonight I'm just drinking water with spruce tips in it, but we used to make ales from so many different seasonal things before hops came along, like the sage ale. And actually, that's in another jug in there. I've got some sage and water today. Um, but just nice ways to bring all of this to table or into your cordials, making cocktails and cordials from things like elderberry that also make a good winter medicine. These are some cocktails we made at Celia Thaxter's garden for an eco culinary institute that we run every fall out there with chefs and scientists and historians. Um, Thoreau says we need the tonic of wilderness and tonics like cordials and beers have been a way that we understood that medicine fortified us. I'm sorry, herbs and plants fortified us, um, whether we were eating them or drinking them, whether they go back to things like moxie or, you know, we did more herbal until the 19th century when, you know, 7-Up had lithium in it and Coke had cocaine. And, you know, we pulled back from those things, fortunately, but there's so much more in the medicinal side that existed before that, that good mixologists are all bringing to life again. And what that's bringing to life is seasonality. And that's part of what I love about the local foods movement most and that I write about is how to rekindle the ability to live seasonally, moving through a year of seasons and multiple seasons and the holidays that corresponded to them and the eating traditions. What are we coming up with right now? We're moving from rhubarb season to strawberry rhubarb season and sorrel and sweet Sicily. And, you know, we just moved out of maple sugaring season and, you know, in the local movement, seasonality brings back a lot. And it's not a new thing. In the 19th century, Ralph Waldo Emerson said, or he, he put out the idea that we shouldn't be buying sugar if it's prosperous, prospering slave plantation owners, but reminded us that when we buy maple syrup from another farm in New England, we're keeping New England farms viable for the future. And that was over a hundred years ago. And we're still working to do that, but the message only gets louder and more needed. 
So my book tries to help us move through seasonal holidays, the plants associated with them, plants like angelica that are a part of early spring, or sweet woodruff and rose that you might find in May wine, sorrel that you might make sorrel soup with, or asparagus, um, that really help us eat the season. But also connect up to the spirituality of season. Reeds have been connectors to seasons for centuries. They represented the wheel of life and reminded us that even when we're in that lowest part of the wheel, that we're always gonna keep spiraling through and spring's gonna come around again and it's gonna be really hard to move it. But you take the elements of the season at Christmas time, what do we have? Holly and bay, rosemary and ivy, spruce and pine, wintergreen. So those things become the winter decorations. But we also made seasonal wreaths, um, lavender, sage, rosemary, things that helped us make our door a portal and a reminder to that connection. And our yard's connections to beauty and reminding ourselves that so much of that beauty can be enjoyed in the foods and drinks when we become more comfortable with those plants. You probably all have violets trying to grow in your lawn and maybe you've been trying to eradicate them for uh, decades. Instead, I make violet syrup. Um, maybe you can candy them or make jam from them or make chive blossom vinegar, eat Solomon seal flowers or calendula flowers and nasturtiums or make herbal ice cubes for your drinks. They're all fun ways to participate from the garden using garden history and best practices. Like I said, rhubarb and strawberry season are what we're moving through now, and they've been a big part of our regional history. But also the edible flowers that remind us that if you, you know, if we think we're going to survive eating iceberg lettuce into the future, we're probably all gonna die. They're water hogs, they need to be shipped from other places, although there are some good heirloom varieties that are pretty wonderful. But a lot of what people did in the past was eat every edible plant in their yard, weeds, flowers, you know, this is a salad with wood sorrel flowers, daylily flowers, pansies, violets, rose petals, spinach, lettuce, sorrel, sweet sicily, chive. You know, it might have two dozen different ingredients, but it's what your yard afforded that day. And it's getting playful with these herbs, maybe making an herb cheese or herb butters or vinegars, oils, honeys, but getting ourselves reacquainted with all that you could do from a plant other than deadheading it and throwing it in the compost remembering things like the language of flowers and the fun that people had in the past when they knew more about their plants. And to me, that's one of the fun things about getting older is the long-term relationships we have with friends in our life, but also I look at plants that way. We get to know them better by different names, by different attributes, and our comfort level with them grows greater so that we can enjoy them in better ways. And as this other fun woodcut from Mary Azarian says, happy is he who hath the power to gather wisdom from a flower. And one of those ways that I see a great pleasure in keeping flowers around me is the lawn. You know, lawns, and I have a chapter in the book about that. This is a picture of my front lawn right now. It has English daisies and a juga and dandelion and clover and violets and that's a diverse lawn that I see so much more beauty in than the monoculture of a lawn. But then it's also the joy of knowing your kids can sit out there and play without pesticides and chemicals, that you can eat those things. We didn't have any dandelions in our lawn that survived because that same grandmother I told you about would be out there in spring with a pen knife, digging them all up and sauteing up with some olive oil and garlic and a squeeze of lemon or some vinegar. And that was a spring tonic in my family. So really getting to use those things again and enjoy our lawns in different ways that also benefit pollinators and habitat. Letting things like grow back from the edges so that milkweed takes seed and joe pie weed and iron weed. And this is what all the meadow ground around me looked like as a kid. In my neighborhood, roadsides were full of things like this and golden rod and aster and we are so used to weed whacking and mowing and manicuring that our yards are lifeless. But when I let this happen in my backyard, 
I have a backyard now full of birds and fireflies and wildlife. And then if we have a bad tick year, I mow up around the house a little bit more and I just let those back edges go. But E.B. White has a great quote about this that he, uh, where he says, I would feel more optimistic about a bright future for man if he spent less time proving what he can, that he can outwit nature and more time tasting her sweetness and respecting her seniority. Mother Earth has been waiting for us to get a clue again. And I think if you've read books like Doug Tallamy's, it's a great reminder that we can, each of us in our backyards, start doing what the Herb Society talks about is creating green bridges, connectors from one yard to the next. And you know, when I'm doing this, suddenly my neighbor's not mowing the same way and the seeds are spreading from one yard to the next. So I want you to think back to who taught you your love of plants and nature. And then I'm gonna ask you who you're mentoring now, because there's a generation of kids stuck behind computers, looking at what would probably seem like a really desperate and frightening world. And they need you and I to help connect them up to gardening, get their hands in the dirt, because it's medicine as much as the food that we grow from it and reconnect in these gardens. And so that's really the, the biggest part of my book is helping us find ways through traditional plants and skills. So my book has just come out, uh, well, it's coming out on the 22nd. Um, it's been great to see that it's, it was the best selling new book in horticulture for about four months on Amazon. But what I really love and what fits the ethic and the ethos of this for me better is, Go to your local bookstore, get them to carry it for you, and um, or maybe come out to one of the book signing events I'll be doing all over the place. But I would love it if you um, think you might enjoy it. Get the book, and um, I hope it means I hope it means something to you. I'm proud to take it out into the world. It's a humble little work, um, but I have to say one of the things that I think is a good shift in the world is we are starting to learn that everybody's voice is a legitimate voice to hear. And I finally got to the point where I realized I needed to use my voice as a gardener. And I had the good fortune to be able to do it in this book. And I think it's how all of us teach from gardens and it's how all of us were taught in a garden. So I hope it shares some good things with you and that you can do the same with people in your own habitat as well. So I think that's, well, I'll also just mention, uh, I've gone on to be the founding bed, uh, director of uh, this place, Bedrock Gardens, that's just becoming a new, public, the, uh, a new public garden for New Hampshire. And I'll be doing my first book signing um, on the third weekend of June. I think it's the 19th and 20th of June. So if you're anywhere in New England and you would love to see a beautiful garden that you can't even imagine the the nature of and how beautiful it is. It's a 37 acre farm that's been repurposed into an, oa an oasis of art, horticulture and inspiration. And um, so anyways, I'll be there. You can Google it and see our website, but that will be the first book signing I have coming up. And if you love gardening, it's certainly an easy drive from Situate and the South Shore. So I hope you'll make it there and I'll leave it with that. And maybe if you want, we can take some questions. Oh, I'm also going to just mention, if you are on Facebook, um, I have an, a page called the Heirloom Gardener, John Forty. And I'd love it if you'd toggle on over and join the page and say hello. I try to um, use it like the book, really, to teach seasonal things, uh, you know, put forth seasonal observations, art, organic tips, herbalism, um, but all things that celebrate garden and seasonality and place. And um, I try to keep it fun, inspiring, long and informative. And I think we all need a little bit more of that in the world too. So now I really believe it with that and say thank you. And why don't we take it over to some questions? That was wonderful, John. If you could there you go stop sharing thank you stop <laughs> sharing is that like telling me to shut up no, no <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding I'm sorry. 
Um, <laughs> if everybody, if you'd like to ask questions, just unmute yourself and please, um, if there are any questions, we'd love to hear them. Uh, we've got something here in the chat. Can you recommend good sources for heirloom seeds to start? Sure. Um, so one of the things that I um, love to do, and I'm sorry, I'm trying to put it into a view so I can see all of you and who's asking. Um, these days when I go to farmer's market, a lot of the farmers are bringing heirloom plants to market. And one of my favorite ways to get heirloom seeds is get your heirloom plants from the farmer's market, grow the things. And when you get your first tomato, melon, squash, cucumber, save the seeds of the best and plant them next year. That's a connection that is so meaningful as a gardener to me. Uh, but also you can um, look, you know, Google if any of your local libraries have a seed lending library. All around me garden clubs have been starting up seed lending libraries. Um, there are great sources in New England and this region like Johnny's Seeds in Albion, Maine. Um, high mowing seeds in Vermont, um, Hudson Valley Seed um, Project are all some great regional purveyors. But again, online, there's a lot more that you can find as well. But just having conversations with gardeners in your garden club and your historical society that might have some great old edibles to share um, the seeds of, or maybe right now you see an iris in a neighbor's yard that they can tell you goes back to Sarah Orne Jewett or whatever the local thing might be. Those are fun ways to share heirlooms too. And we have a um, something from Danielle North. You are the voice that has spoken to me because you promote, practice, and participate in a beautiful reminder that food and medicine are a series of connections and stewardship and nature is that which we are part of. Many thanks. Oh, thank you. That's and that was beautiful. from Danielle North. And then Anne asks, what books inspire you? Mm. Um, well, one that had a lot of impact uh, that I read as soon as I finished this book was um, Robin Wall Kimmerer is a... Um, a native woman and a scholar. She teaches in New York. She's a professor in the college there. And her book, Braiding Sweetgrass, I think is one of the most beautiful and eloquent poetic works of science, environmentalism, and humanitarianism. You know, she really blends. Oh, beautiful, Sally. Thank you for showing that. It's a it's a powerful work and I think really again there's a lot to look at in the world and just hold your head and think oh my god but I also look at interdisciplinary learning like that that's happening now the opportunity for people to learn from multiple angles and I see so much hope in that uh, I just finished reading the over story about a month ago another wonderful book um, that's really helping us value the trees that grow in our environment in a different way. Um, but honestly, I just love reading. And um, so if any of you have any books you love that you think touch on some of these things, pop them into chat too for the others because that's all my brain's got right now. <laughs> um, and Genevieve asks, how does jewel weed combat poison ivy? So in nature, a lot of the plants that are toxins or poisons to us have an antidote that typically grows alongside of them. And uh, jewelweed grows typically in the same habitat as poison ivy. And so if you know you just walked through poison ivy on a hot day or you brushed into it, you take the stalks of jewelweed. It's in the impatience family. So it's juicy like your impatient Lucy. <laughs> I wasn't trying to rhyme. Sorry, that was obnoxious. But you, you, you take the stem and you just smear it on where you know you were exposed to the poison ivy and it dissipates the oils and um, prevents you getting poison ivy. All right, great. And then we have Anne who says, inspirational. I keep forgetting to use the chive flowers, the sage teaching 
that the Solomon seal flowers are delicious. Can't wait to make a flower salad. Thank you. Mm, nice. And any live questions? Yeah, anybody wanna join in? Criticisms, <laughs> um, observations. You'll have oh, to unmute yourself if you wanted to, um, to ask a question. You will have to unmute yourself. Okay, I have a quick question. Yep, Sally. Um, I'm just wondering where in New Hampshire is Bedrock Gardens? It's in the middle of nowhere, um, but the nearest thing is University of New Hampshire. So it's, it's not far from Portsmouth, um, but uh, it would take you about an hour to get there. Um, but it's in Lee, New Hampshire. Okay. On 125. And, um, you know, we have directions on our website or you can Google it to go. But there's, you know, if you haven't been up to New Hampshire in a while, it, there's so much you can do when you're there. And Lee is this town where, you know, there's not, when I talk about preserving land, a lot of that has to be done legislatively too, um, and by good practices. And in Lee, over a quarter of the land is in green space. And that means they've made it a priority through the Agricultural Commission to set bylaws in the town so that farming really can maintain itself in that town. And there are a lot of land trusts as well, and um, but tons of farms. It's really like a breadbasket for the region. So there are parts of Lee you can drive around and apart from some of the extra cars parked and trucks parked there, you might think you're in the 18th century still. My birthday's June 19th, so I think I'll celebrate that way. Oh, nice. That'll be the first day. That'll be my first, first book signing. I hope I'll see you there, Sally. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Say hi. Okay. And happy birthday. Thanks. And Tim has said a Sand County Almanac by Aldo Leopold. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. that That's is one, of the, one of the folks that I quoted in the talk mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Great call. And I think we heard somebody else that was trying to jump in with a question. Yeah, Danielle has raised her hand. If you want to unmute, yeah, Danielle, hi. hi. Um, so um, just recently in one of my Facebook gardening pages, the debate and conundrum has come up to native or to not native and how much of a mixture. And people who are really committed to bringing in native songbirds and keeping, you know, in in close connection and trying to maintain our native plants are really torn. And so I wonder what your thoughts are on that. Yep. I have a whole essay in there, I think called indigenous and really I am a person who believes that biodiversity is a good thing. I always, like I did with my talk, try to start with the native layer first like I do with heirlooms because they are underrepresented and they need stewardship and they need advocates. But I'm also not what some people would call native plant Nazis. I, I am a part of an immigrant uh, culture that came here. I've got, I'm a mutt, you know, I've got Irish ancestors, Italian ancestors, there's some Greek and some uh, English. It's just, a, you know, we've all, come here like the plants that came along with us. And I believe there's a place for all of that. The dandelions that you'll hear are so great for our native pollinators. They were introduced in the 17th century and yet they have a place. Rosa rugosa, which we think of as this plant of New England, it arrived on these shores in the 13th century when we look at pollen analysis and seed analysis. Does that make it native or not? Yes. You know, there are so many shades to all of this that what I really like is living in a culture that just doesn't see black and white, but it sees green and variation. And so to me, there's a place for all of it, but I always think the best thing to do is fit in as much native as you can. And when you learn the native plants, you see the beauty in them and you don't mind. You don't feel like your garden is deficient, but I'll always have a little of this and a little of whatever brings me joy. Thank you. Yep.
Um, Lynn asked if you will be having, <clears throat> excuse me, any book signings in Maine. Yes, I'm, um, I think I've got something lined up in Portland. Uh, I'm doing a, another thing for the Mount Desert uh, Garden Club and I've got a few bookstores up that way. Um, this summer. I just finished working on a tour schedule with my publisher and I'll probably put that up on my Facebook page at some point uh, before too long. But, you know, the book hasn't even come out yet. So I'm trying to hold back and not be obnoxious about this with people. I've only posted a few times, but I will try to put out more word about when I'm coming around. And I think I might even be doing something at a bookstore in Situate uh, this year. I'm certainly doing some on the Cape as well. And um, so keep your eyes peeled. Great. Um, Mary says Bedrock Gardens is such a wonderful place. Can you come back and talk about the garden? Can I come back and talk about the garden? <laughs> yes, that's what she's asked. Okay. I, I will just say that I've you know, I lecture all over the country and around the world and I go to a lot of public gardens and there are a lot of cookie cutters out there. And when I first went to Bedrock Gardens, I was blown away because it is the antithesis of a cookie cutter garden. On this 37 acre farm, there is room after room after room of each with its own emotion, a different set of plants, a uh, different mood and feeling. And you really go on journeys there. And like our volunteer coordinator, Deb, likes to say, her blood pressure goes down 20 points every time she moves through the gardens there. And tons of wildlife. It's just, it's a beautiful space. Um, so I would encourage you, take a look on our website. There are wonderful images there. Um, Chronicle New Hampshire just did a piece on it that you can see on the home page as well. And, um, you know, it's the best, but the best thing is really coming to see it in person and why not do it on a book signing weekend? So <laughs> if you can come on up that weekend, maybe we have to put together a field trip and come up and visit. Yeah. Garden clubs and historic, you know, a lot of clubs do. And uh, if a club wants to do that and book a tour, I try to be the person who does the garden club tour. If you are interested yeah. in doing that. Uh, Tom asks, what are some of the heirlooms specific to Situate and Norwell? <clears throat> so historically, you know, for food based plants, and again, even with heirlooms, like when we talk about native plants, that, three sisters planting combination that I told you about, those plants also moved across the whole country from the Southwest. And so even those are immigrants to New England, but there was uh, historically growing in our region, an eight row multicolor flint corn. The pumpkins were um, what today we know of as Connecticut field pumpkin and New England pie pumpkin. We had patty pan and acorn type squashes. And the beans down that way were more like, um, the, well, they were the soldier bean uh, more commonly than the cranberry bean up this way. Um, and then um, certainly, you know, that's for the food plants. And I mentioned some of the others, but heirlooms certainly should also include the native plants of place. And there are just so many. And I do try to touch on a lot of those in the book as well. So I won't belabor it here. Great, <clears throat> excuse me. Anyone else? Any questions or comments? No, I think that might be it. Well, it's really great to see all of you and so many familiar faces. And uh, yeah, hi Deb and, uh, and Sally and Jane. And <laughs> um, anyways, um, I feel like I'm on romper room now, <laughs> sorry. Hey, Miss Jean, <laughs> you got your magic mirror? <laughs> anyways, um, really nice to be with all of you tonight. And um, thank you. hope you like the book. <laughs>